All right, so uh, welcome back. Um, I hope you got a little bit of time to play with some stuff in Collab. Not Collab, sorry. I've been talking talking to someone else about Collab. Collab's another tool. We'll talk about that at the, at the last week of class um, in Runway. Um, so I hope you're having fun and finding some cool things. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over sort of like what we're going to do this week. And then I think we're actually going to we'll spend a little bit of time to actually look at some work and maybe have some questions that people have from things. So um, let me share my screen really quickly. Cool. Um, so one note, uh, remember we do not have class next week. I'm um, gonna take off for Thanksgiving, even though I assume pretty much no one's leaving their apartments, but you know, just to give us a little bit of that uh, holiday break feel at least, um, we'll take next week off. So um, that's actually great timing for us because um, we're gonna be working, we're gonna be talking about in the last half of class, we're gonna talk about making a data set. Um, so taking, making a data set takes a little bit of time. Um, I'll talk through some different techniques, but basically like, you'll probably want that extra week to make a data set because it's going to take you a while. So um, we'll talk a lot about that for the second half of class and real questions. Um, I'm happy to do that. Also, I should say, if you're like working on a data set and you have questions, um, I'm not leaving town or doing anything next week. So if people want to like do like a one-on-one -on -one session or just like meet next week to talk through data sets, I'm happy to do that. So um, we can talk about that more at the end of class. If, if anyone's interested in that, uh, we, can, we can work on some of those things. Um, so this week, we're going to look at a couple of things. Um, we will be discussing the homework that people put together just as we can sort of see some work. Um, I like to sort of like every week start with just like looking at people's work because I think it's just a fun thing to do. Um, I'll be going over vector inputs. Um, I saw at least one person had tried playing with StyleGAN stuff before. So um, I'll talk about how vector inputs work um, and we can look at that. Uh, then I'm going to show you just a bunch of projects of students uh, from previous classes, their work, um, as well as some other works from some other folks. Um, so we can, maybe you'll get some inspiration. Um, remember the last week of class, we'll do like a little show and tell. Um, so you don't have to like plan anything big for that, but if you want to, you certainly can. Um, I think everyone will, just if you do sort of the homework, we'll have some fun and you'll have some cool projects to show off. So um, regardless, like we'll do that in the last week of class, sort of like have a nice little get together and, and show off some work. Um, we'll then be looking at really quickly, we'll do like a 10 or 15 minute thing on chaining. Um, chaining is one of the cooler parts of Runway and actually something that Runway does really well that other tools are really, really bad at. Um, so I'll just quickly show how that works. And then uh, we'll mostly focus the last half of class on data sets. Um, so, and then if you have questions or whatever about data sets, we'll go through some of that stuff. Sound good? Cool. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just, dig through the, um, the Slack channel a little bit and you can sort of like, um, maybe we'll just show off some work and we can talk about things. So I'll start at the top of the page. So thanks, Steve. I think that means you're gonna go first. So um, wanna talk a little bit about just what you played with and what you really made? Sure, yeah. Um, so I played with a style GAN that was trained on um, Wikipedia's art archive, I guess. And so every time I queried it, it would like spit up a bunch of different um, images that it thought to be art. And then through that, I was able to kind of select images that I thought were interesting. It, it was really cool. You, you spoke last week about how like AI wasn't necessarily good at everything generally, but rather it was like hyper-specific. So like I could start to see certain trends, like the AI really liked skin and, and like it would generate figures that had a lot of skin in it, you know, but then it didn't necessarily understand like the form so it would generate these like really strange forms that had like skin tones on them um and so i found it this really interesting interplay between myself as the interpreter of the machine and the machine itself just like the the vectors it was like this huge grid right and there were just like thousands and thousands of images being generated around like this idea and then you would have to like go in and manually pick out the ones that you thought were interesting so I played a bit with that um, and everything else I played with didn't necessarily yield the same satisfying results, but that was definitely the most interesting one for me. Cool, yeah. Um, yeah, Peter is an internet colleague of mine. I, I've, we hang out on Twitter a lot um, and his, his style GAN model that's all in the art is really, really cool. And um, I think I mentioned to Steve uh, that he's also been working on a new version of it um, that is showing a remarkable, like way better results um, these are three, four images from his thing. And you can see even the portraits themselves are looking really, really good. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about uh, StyleGAN and sort of how the uh, network input works. But um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. And uh, we'll talk a lot about 
how to actually train a good looking style game model uh, starting next week. Um, we'll talk a little bit how to make a data set for it, but uh, we'll definitely talk about um, maybe ways to avoid stuff like this. Um, although I think this, this result here on the left looks really, really good. That looks like a pretty um, relatively like good version of a painting of a, of a landscape. Whereas this one, like, it's really funny. The face is decent, but like everything else is like kind of twisted and distorted, like very Cronenberg. You see, you see a lot of Cronenberg style stuff um, out of out of style again. Um, cool. Um, oh, and you also did stuff with. Oh, you did stuff with morphing, yeah. Um, or you were asking about that. We will definitely cover stuff on uh, how to do morphing um, in probably next week more. Yeah. Uh, John, I think you're up next. Um, so yeah, so I was just, you know, playing around with a few things and I was, you know, I was attracted more to, to the, um, models, is that, um, that, that, um, interpreted things, uh, to a greater degree than, um, I mean, some of the things came across to me almost like, like Photoshop filters in a way, but I know that the underlying, you know, method of it working is completely different, but th that was a little of less interest to me. So I did like the idea of, and this is, I know we did this, you know, the first thing in the last class, but inputting words and seeing just what is translated with that information that is available now. I mean, this is, it's kind of interesting to me and it's sort of like a, just like this kind of default thing. So, so then of course I work on book covers. So let me just put in a title and see what shows up. And then it's like, oh, this could be an entire series of something in some way. And then I'm sure it could, it'll change each week or every month or, or some kind of thing, how, however that. And uh, there was some, you know, I, I would also sort of be interested in, well, what if you fed an entire book to something and it was able to interpret that in some way and pull out what information that I have to kind of pull out when I'm, so I know this is, but it's kind of interesting looking at it from this place of like, oh, this is like the beginning, the very beginning of something like this. And um, and then the other one was, um, I know I, I thought this was, you know, pretty cool how it, how it figured out how that it was a tree and, and interpreted it. And then, but then other things that, you know, of course it's not going to have the facility to, um, um, interpret something that I made into something else, but it's kind of really kind of, you know, who knows what happened there, but. Yeah, uh, Big Bygan is like one of my favorite models to play with inside a runway. Cause you do, you get results like this where you're like, oh, that's really, really close. But then you also get results like this, which are like absolutely insane. And you're just sort of like, how did this come up with this? And I can sort of tell you like the way these models look like, and we talked about this a little bit last week is they look for edges and convolutions essentially. So really you can sort of see what this one found is it found this edge, right? So it tried to like, try to represent that edge. And then right. it probably found some of these circles mm -hmm. um, and it tries to match those. Um, and again, because this model has never seen John Gall collages, it doesn't know, you know, it doesn't have that data in its, in its right. repository, right. but it might've gotten other record covers or some other book cover. Um, and it tried to like find the representation of that. Um, but yeah, Big Bygan is like a really fun and weird model because you never know what you're going to get out of it. Um, and I often find, um, you know, if you feed it just straight lines or even just like single like pencil line drawings, you get really cool stuff out of it too, because it's trying to match those edges and those convolutions to other things it's, it already knows about. Yeah, SFL just had to kind of get through the, let's stump the model, you know, portion of the program and now it can kind of move on. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's... Um, you will often, I think for many people, like I used to do two weeks of play with models and like by the first week, people were just sort of like, yeah, cool. I've done a bunch of stuff. They do feel like Photoshop filters. Can we move on to like making my own models? Um, so yeah, it's, you know, the, the truth is a lot of those models do end up feeling a little bit like Photoshop filters, um, but you do find some good ones in there or you find stuff like, oh, this is interesting. And I think to your point, like this is the early stage of how like I'm, a, a really robust machine learning model could begin to turn a book into a into a book cover like those right. sort of things. Yeah. Um, Ryan, looks like you were also doing similar stuff. Yeah, I was I was uh, interested in that the big big bygan is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, I tend to like to uh, try to find the spectrum 
you know, like the opposite ends of the spectrum of tools and stuff like that. So this, I was looking at something a little bit more organic in nature and it tend to represent that like pretty well. I mean, um, these, <laughs> these look like rock formations that like I would see in the same kind of vicinity of this photograph. Um, then I was trying it on more like an object based kind of, uh, image and it actually i mean it's pretty awesome like what it kind of came up with um for the, the, its interpretation of the mug was still pretty cool and then i took some a little bit more simplistic line artwork just to see what it does again like the the interpretation i think is so cool um i tend to like that weird the weirdness of it but um again it's it was interesting to see like the extent of the different image types. And I try to play a little bit more with some of you were talking about, you know, adding blurs to it. And um, so it was interesting too, to like get the different, uh, see how it interprets it with some of that stuff. I was poking in the, 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 some more of like the vector or what, you know, whatever that is a little bit more. Then I'm interested to see what you say about it later. I didn't post some of it but there is like this nebular typography uh one which was fun uh i think after i don't know if it was who posted it maybe violet the the simpsons one i was like oh my god so i started playing around with that and uh yeah so i was just like all over the, <laughs> all over the place just like starting and stopping things and just tossing random stuff in it so it was, it was pretty fun just to see what happened yeah, awesome. That's basically what this week was supposed to be about. Just like mess around and not everything will be good, but like you'll you'll sort of learn like how certain things work. Yeah. Um, Violet, yeah, let's talk about the Simpsons model. Yeah, so I mostly played around with style GAN models with the vector inputs. Um, and I thought this one looked so interesting, especially when I saw that it was trained over top Basquiat, which like was really surprising to me, but it, it actually is reflected really well in the outputs, I think. Like I, I this is what a cross between like a Simpsons Basquiat AI character would be, totally. Um, and I also played with the same model that Steve was playing with and it was just so much fun and so like addictive, honestly. Like I just couldn't, I had to, make myself turn it off because I was like, I'm gonna rack up so much money, but I could have gone on for like hours and hours. It was so cool. And this one in particular, I, I saved a bunch of paintings that it generated and this one was just like super fucking creepy. Yeah, it's like, um, so I think as Steve mentioned, this is trained on WikiArt. And so obviously WikiArt has a lot of historical art, which is you know not in copyright. Um, copyright becomes a big issue, obviously, with a lot of these models. So, um, yeah, so you get like this is definitely like that. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm really, I failed all my art history classes or whatever, but this definitely has sort of a, a look of a certain era, right? Um, yeah, it's really cool. But also like that sort of Cronenberg esque sort of like new, it's like everything comes out like a Bosch painting in some ways. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Allison. Um, so I really got into um, using Moonit. It was really fun to play around with. Um, I don't know if the sound will play. The sound's not really important. It might be a little bit too loud, but um, I have this music video that I really love and it's just like a guy playing the guitar. Um, and I wanted to see kind of how I could sort of bring in like different um, kind of like film sequences of about like sets of 25, just 125 in total and see how it would kind of um, play through um, on the video. Um, so it was really interesting to see how, like, just playing around with the styles, it could be interpreted um, and how it would come to life, just filtering through, um, especially because how it would, like, kind of inter interpret, like, just, like, him moving around, moving back and forth. So that was really um, fun to play with. I, I do wish, like, when I was playing with it, that there was, like, an easy way to just to grab everything and export it. Um, I feel like there maybe is a shortcut somewhere that I'm just not figuring out yet. Um, but it was uh, really fun, and I felt like the tediousness of it um, paid off. So it was cool. Yeah, we can look at, um, I'll, I'll probably next week, I'll, or I guess in two weeks, I'll show how to do some exports that do maybe make it a little bit easier. Um, the other thing that Allison and I found out sort of together is uh, Runway is a little weird about the type of codec, the, in the video you upload. Um, if you upload certain types of video codecs, it kind of chokes and dies. 
Um, what I have found works really well is if you're on a Mac and you just open a, open your video in QuickTime. Um, um, if you just open your video in QuickTime and then do file export as whatever size you want, um, whatever, I don't even know what codec this outputs to, but whatever you use here, this will generally work in Runway. Um, so you might just need to export your video out again and then import that in Runway and it should work. Um, but I've definitely had a lot of experiences where, especially using like Handbrake or other like DVD ripping software, like you get weird results and it chokes um, when it tries to run through Runway. Usually what happens is it will give you an error message and you get an, e an email saying, hey, there was an error and then they refund your money like an hour later. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, that you, know, you might be like, oh, it looks like they stole my money. And I'm, I will tell you, they, you, do, you do get refunded. It just takes a little bit of time. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. Um, and that's probably like one of the tri tricks if you run into an issue like that um, to try with, with things. Um, cool, Justin, looks like you've got some examples here. Yeah, I, I, I played uh, after the class last week, I just uh, kind of zoned out and just was uh, uploading some videos and playing with uh, motion capture. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I was trying to do some stills, but I was having problems exporting. They, were, they always were like way too tiny. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't sure what how I was exporting it or what I was doing there. But um, yeah, I, I, I um, did just, um, I, like I mentioned last class, I'm, I'm really into basketball. I do a, a basketball magazine uh, thing on the side. And so I uploaded two uh, different uh, dunk contest clips and ran those through the um, um, motion capture stuff. Cool. Yeah, this one's really interesting. So um, I don't do a lot with uh, with like motion capture um, in this class. Uh, it's just not actually really my expertise. But what I like about this one is so the way that this one is supposed to work is it's supposed to find the skeletons of people. So you can kind of see it um, in the basketball player here, right? It's like this is his left side, right side arms. But it's also clearly picking up the crowd. So like mm -hmm. it yeah. sees way more skeletons in the crowd. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so in terms of file si or like size of images, um, one of the challenges with most machine learning models is they tend to be pretty low res. Um, what most people do with stuff like uh, like motion capture is they capture it at a small size, so that way it's um, it's essentially uh, you know really quick, like right, like you can get it almost real time, and then they scale it up to actually do artwork with it. So they would actually take these. You can get the um, I think these models also export out the coordinates of certain things. So it might be like a full skeleton and the coordinates of it. So you mm. take those coordinates and you can apply that to like a bigger image or graphic. Um, so that tends to be how people use these sort of video capture uh, tools. Um, okay. Yeah, so just be like, be aware of that. Um, there is also a model, um, if we get time at the end of class, I can show it. There's a model, there's a couple models in, um, in Rome that are called super resolution models. And what those do is they scale up your images, um, 2X or 4X. Um, and if you're used to like trying to do that in Photoshop, like using linear interpolation or whatever, um, you know, it gets kind of blurry. These models actually add texture in at a higher resolution. Um, so like machine learning is actually really good at that, surprisingly enough. Um, it's not perfect, but it's better than what you might get through Photoshop. Um, so those are models you might like, uh, when we actually, let's do, well, when we do chaining, I'll make sure we cover that because that's a common use of something you might use chaining, right? Where you, the final output you want is actually just a higher resolution output from it. Um, so we can look at that. Um, there are also many, many tools that do super resolution outside of Runway. Um, so actually Photoshop just added, they have a super resolution model inside of Photoshop that uses machine learning. Um, so I can, if anyone's interested, I can show you where to turn that on um, inside the Photoshop settings. There's a lot of uh, tools that exist, like that you can buy as standalone apps to do that sort of stuff. There are some web tools that'll, that allow you to do that sort of thing. So that's a pretty common, um, common practice or like a thing that I, you see machine learning do a lot of. Um, and mostly if I ever do prints of my own artwork, that's what I have to use. Um, because even StyleGAN, which is pretty high, high resolution, um, can only do up to 1024 by 1024. So that's still like a three inch you know, print at 300 DPI. Um, so if we want higher than that, we generally need to do something else. Um, and I will say machine learning, the super resolution networks, they, they add a thing that sort of makes it look machiney, but it's better than like a Photoshop print, right? That sort of gets blurry. So um, yeah, just be aware of those. Those are definitely like sort of challenges of Again, early days of machine learning, where um, you know a lot of places are doing these to prove theories and concepts. Um, a lot of these AI labs are just trying to prove theory or uh, that things work, um, and they aren't really focused on generating full high-res outputs and that sort of thing. Um, Adobe's starting to get into that, but other other places are sort of just now getting there, um, and it takes a lot more computational power 
Um, basically every scale up is like another power of two or whatever. So you can imagine the higher and higher you get, um, the more of a GPU you need. So most of this stuff runs on, you know, really, really high end gaming GPUs or higher. Um, so I think the, the GPUs that, uh, runway uses behind the scenes are generally like to buy one off the, off the shelf is like 25, $3,000. Um, so you get one of those for a lot less. Um, but they're still pretty computationally like expensive and they can't really do super high res stuff. Um, yeah. So just be aware of that. That's definitely one of the challenges with a lot of machine learning work. Um, cool. This is really awesome. Um, I would love like every time you're making stuff, like, please feel free to just drop it in Slack. Um, whenever, um, I will definitely bug people. Cause I just think it's, I think it's nice to just see what other people are working on. It gives you UI ideas about what you can be working on, or maybe even even say like, Hey, this is really cool. Like you should check out this or that, um, that sort of thing. Cause I played with it as well. Um, just sort of nice to see work being made, um, in here. Um, any questions about anything you played with that I can maybe answer now, or we'll maybe answer later. Yeah. Um, on my side, I, I think I, I had a question around like morphing. Are we touching morphing this week or the following week? Uh, probably the following week. Um, okay. so we'll touch on it. I'll, you, once we cover uh, interpolation or sorry, latent spaces, um, you'll sort of begin to understand how it works. Um, and the, but there's some nice tools in Runway that make it a little bit easier. Um, and so maybe if we have time at the end of class, I'll cover just some really basic stuff. Um, the last week of sort of the instructional part of the class, so week four, we'll cover how to actually like control your uh, interpolations a lot more um, okay. and cover the morphing a lot more using um, P5.js and some other tools. Um, Runway has some nice tools, but they're still a little limiting. Um, so we'll sort of like cover those slowly. Like we'll look at Runway's tools and then we'll look at how to make custom tools to do that. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Anything else from anyone? Cool. All right. Well, we can just jump into the slides then. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we'll talk a little bit about what vector inputs are. So obviously as designers and artists, like we're probably used to thinking about vectors as like Adobe Illustrator or Figma and like how we think like a vector is not pixels, um, but a vector in reality, like to most, most mathematicians and science and scientists is um, a direction. So uh, the reason we call things vectors in Adobe Illustrator is you've got all those little points, right? If it's this rectangle, it's each of the four points in that. If you're drawing with the pen tool, it's that little box with the, with the handles. Um, so those are vector points in space, right? So that is a vector. If you're on a 400 by 400 artboard board, like in the middle of point you if you would put your pen there would be 200 by 200 so it's describing a mathematical space um, and then when you draw a vector like uh, that's cur that's curved or whatever you get your vector point and then you also get the handles which are also vectors right so you can like move your handles around and those are also vector points in mathematic space and that determines what the curve is so when we talk about vectors in machine learning we're mostly talking about points in space um, that's really all you want to think about um, so let's imagine that we have a we have points in space, right? Um, that's all we have here. Um, and at one of these points is a picture. Um, we'll talk about how we get to that picture, but just imagine that there is a picture at a point in space. And if I go to a different point in space, there's a different picture, right? So um, at this point in space is a person that looks like this. At this point in space, a person looks like this. Um, now it's important to know that the points in space, the closer they are to each other, the more likely they are to look similar. Right? So if I were to pick these two points in space, you'll see you get a person that looks like this and a person that looks just slightly different. Um, whereas you know, further away, I get a very different looking person. Um, so this is how we describe what, you, what you'll hear called, referred to as a latent space. Um, how the, each model gets to this is essentially like, uh, that's how the network works. So the network sort of like forces these images into these positions based on relativity and, that's, and like how relative they are looking to each other. Um, but this is essentially the basics of a latent space. Um, now, the important thing to know, and this is how we start thinking about morphing, right, is if you were to imagine this point in space and you sort of travel very slowly from here to all the way over to here, like, and you take a sample at each one of these points, you will get a morph. And it will literally look like very linear, right? Like you will see the person's hair turn into this like hairnet thing. Uh, you'll see facial hair develop, that sort of thing. So. When we, when we do morphing or what we call interpolations, really all that is is moving from one space, from one latent point to another. 
Um, now I've sort of described this latent space as two dimensional, um, meaning, you know, this is zero, this is zero, zero, this is zero, one, this is one, zero. Yeah, I think I did it right. Anyway, I'm, I'm bad at math, surprisingly, for doing this stuff. But um, the truth is, uh, StyleGAN in particular uses 512 dimensions of space. Um, no human can really wrap their head around that. Uh, like, even like the best mathematicians can think in like maybe four or five D space. Um, so just think about it, it's like three dimensions, but way, way, way more. And what each of these dimensions is, is what we would describe as a feature. Um, and a feature could be something like hair color or eye color or uh, width of the nose uh, and we're talking about faces. Um, that would be an ideal feature. Uh, machines don't really think like that. Um, so machines sort of like might mix up nose shape and like, I don't know, hairline. Like it, it gets what we, what we describe as entangled. Um, it's a very complicated topic uh, and one that like very, very smart scientists are trying to solve features. Um, but that's the idea is like, there's 512 dimensions. Each of these dimensions makes up some change in the image. And then as this network works, what it does is it sort of pushes things into the space in a way that these features are describable to the machine. So that then when we come back and we say, hey, I want, I want to get this image at this point, it can sort of like do the reverse engineering of saying, okay, that's this feature here, that's this feature here, that's this feature here, and combine it all into an image. So that sounds really easy, but that's that's essentially what it does in some very, very complicated uh, linear algebra and mathematics. Let's see, there's a couple of questions here in the chat. Uh, so, um, so Steve had some questions. Is that related to sampling distance then? Um, higher sampling distance equals further movement and latent space. So is this in regard to um, what's in runway? Yeah, Runway asks, there's like two style GAN options, right? Um, for the Wikipedia one, at least. And one is truncation and the second one is sampling distance. Yep, totally. So let's actually look at this because um, that is a great example. So to find most style GAN models, what you'll want to do is just go to category and then go to community and that'll be style GAN. Um, and there are a ton of different models in here um, because you can generate these all on um, on runway, this is what you'll see most models are. Most models are made from these sort of things. Um, so here's where the latent Springfield one is. Uh, you'll see a lot of images. Uh, this bug one is pretty cool too. Um, let's actually just grab, I'm gonna grab this Bluetooth architecture one and work off this. Um, so we'll go ahead and just from here, click add to workspace. And then we'll come over here and click run remotely. So what's a little complicated is that, um, you know, we talked about, uh, and then you want to switch the input to vector. Um, so we talked about the style GAN model being 512 dimensions, but then what we see in runway is a two-dimensional field. Um, so what they're doing is they're using another like sort of complicated mathematic algorithm to take all those dimensions and squish them down into two dimensions. Um, so once this is up and running, we can sort of look at what that means. So what this means is that uh, essentially they've taken the best features of these images and have sort of compressed it down into a single space so that uh, ideally um, the way it should work is that if you move everything to the right, um, and this is a, a space you can just grab and uh, just click and drag and it will, you can sort of see the, the images develop as you go out here. So see how all of these images as they move to the right sort of have this uh, triangular top, even if like they're altering in different ways, right? Um, like these two look very similar. These two look pretty similar. Um, so this is the idea is that as you move around the space, uh, the spaces you're in, these images should look fairly similar. So you'll see a lot of sort of like flat high rise sort of things over here. Um, you'll see, uh, I don't know what you would, I don't know how you describe this sort of area. Um, but the idea is just that as you move around, these images should be a little bit uh, closer to each other. Um, so Steve was asking about sampling distance and that is, um, sampling distance is like we described, it's sort of like how wide of a, of a net should we cast. Um, so this is going 0.5, which means, um, you know, it's not really too, uh, it's not showing the entire space. Um, so I believe you could set this to 1.0. And when you reset these options, it will uh, redraw the screen. So this can be a little slow, um, just be aware of that. So this should now have like a wider range of options. You can sort of see that as you move out here, um, you'll see it's not as similar of images. Uh, they're all a little bit different. Um, so as you move around, this should be a little bigger. Uh, truncation, we'll talk about truncation. 
actually, hold on, let me, do I, do I have slides for truncation right now? I might. Um, okay, I don't have slides about truncation. So truncation, we can actually just play with this. So truncation, um, sort of, if you imagine like a truncating the space, um, imagine that things that are most in the, uh, let me actually go back to my slides. So imagine that um, at the center of our three-dimensional, 512-dimensional space are the most average or most realistic looking images. And the things outside the space are like the weirder ones or the most different looking ones. So the way we talk about truncation is truncation is how much of that space should I be looking at at any one time? Um, that's not really how it works, but that's a good analogy in the sense that the higher your truncation value is, the more diverse your, your images are gonna be, right? So you'll get more diversity in your images, but you'll get less realistic looking images. So let's actually set this to 1.0. So see already you get like, this image is super weird. It's like clearly not very structural. Um, you get more of these images that have more spaces and gaps in them. Um, yeah, so a lot less realistic looking images, but you also get much more different looking shapes. You know, it, all these are not looking exactly like, um, like other buildings you might see in the real world, right? Um, like this thing looks kind of Blade Runner-ish and not really like what you might really see in reality. But if I make this really small, like let's make this 0.3. So you'll see a lot of these images look a lot, look much more similar, but they're also more realistic looking um, to a certain degree. Uh, with all this stuff, it's a little tough to tell exactly how realistic they are. Um, but you'll see the diversity is way, way lower. Um, so this is kind of what you can do with play with truncation is like, how real do I want this thing to look versus how, uh, how diverse do I want my options to be? Most people usually set it between 0.5 and 0.8. Um, 0.5 sort of being the default. Um, I think uh, runway defaults to 0.7 or 0.8 just to get a little bit more of a diversity in there. Um, you can, uh, I think you can, I don't know how, I don't know if they max this out. I think they max theirs out at 1.0. Um, if you were to use this outside runway, you could actually set this really high. Um, and if you set this to zero, um, you should actually get the exact same image for every single image. Okay, this appears to not be exactly the same, but it should be really, really close to being the same. Um, if you do this in outside runway, it will be literally the exact same image for every image. Um, because again, think about this as like uh, the space that you're in. Um, so if you truncate it to being zero, you know, this wide, it's always gonna be that exact same middle image. Um, so the only models that support truncation are uh, style GAN models, and then there's a model in here called Big GAN, um, which actually let me pull that up real quick because that's uh, it's sort of an interesting one to look at. Um, this is different than Big by GAN, um, but the two sort of play off each other. Um, so if I add Big GAN in my workspace, um, so you'll see here that you actually have to pick a category before you begin running your model. So if I set this to vector. Um, and there's a bunch of categories in here. And these are all the different categories of images. Most of them are animals, um, but there's probably some other stuff in here. Yeah, there's like baseball, basketball, bassoon. Let's pick a basketball and then let's hit run remotely. So style GAN is what we call um, unclassified, meaning there are no categories of images. Uh, it's, all, it's usually all one image type, right? It's buildings, it's Simpson characters, that sort of thing. Whereas Big GAN allows for classified images or categories. Um, the difference being that you have to pick a category before you start your model, um, and you can't really change it afterward, I don't think at least. You might be able to change it, um, but like you can't go from basketball to, uh, I don't know, like bassoon. You can't interpolate between those two because they're fixed sort of categories. Um, once this is up and running, I'll show an example of how this works. Derek, with by GAN, uh, is there a way for us to choose multiple categories to kind of blend them together at the onset, or is it just purely classified? It only picks one thing. It's purely classified, yeah, which is one of the challenges of it and why you might not be that excited about it, um, to be honest, because um, it is a little bit of a challenge um, to get to just like sort of like feels like it's sort of like cool. I can just make basketballs all day. And it's like it actually is like it feels fairly limiting. 
I don't know if this thing is just taking really slow or what's going on here. Um, let's go over to this one. Um, so one note I want to make, um, just so you're aware, is you can actually download the vector of this. Um, if you want to see the actual mathematic value of this, there's this. So basically, oh, see, I should just say, okay, so to download an image um, from this model, just clicking around, uh, what you do is you click on an image, then you'll come down here to the bottom right and hit save image. Uh, and this is just going to pick where you want to save your image to. Um, go ahead and save that out. Um, this is sort of the manual way, right? You go around and just pick, I like this image, I like this image, I like this image, and download them all. That's totally reasonable. Um, if you want to save out the vector, which we will actually want to do in week four, we will we will use this vector for, for a purpose. Um, you can, up here, you can just click on your image and then click on save vector um, and click that button and tell it where to save. And once it's done saving, you'll just click this down here really quickly. And if you were to open this in um, a program that can read uh, code, um, this is what your this is what this vector looks like. Um, and, and literally all it is is 512 numbers that go that are a float number between uh, negative one and one. Um, that's it. So that like that's this we'll use this in week four. Um, but to most of us, this doesn't mean anything. Um, one thing to note is you do need the vector plus what your truncation value is. So if you were to uh, change the vector, like if you were to change the truncation value between like say you like liked it at 0.7 and then you moved it to 0.1, it's very likely going to be a different image. So make sure that you have both the vector written down as well as what the truncation value was, because um, those will be important to get that same image back. Uh, so the reason you might want to save the vector is let's say you wanted to like come back and reopen that exact image. You can also then load in a vector. Um, and when you load in the vector, it will um, actually like redraw it with that vector in mind. So um, not most of us probably won't use that that often, but I will show you how we might use that um, using P5JS at a later date. Um, let's see if this is right learning now. Oh, okay. Oh, so here we go. Um, Justin, you might want to mess with this. So apparently basketball is not just basketball, it's basketball players. Um, and here you can sort of see, like, let's crank the sampling distance up a little bit. Um, and you'll see, you know, these don't look that dissimilar, but there's definitely like a very funny morphing thing of like, Everyone has everyone has long arms. Everyone's arms are up in the air, um, which is you know just kind of a funny thing about some of these models. <laughs> My guess is um, I believe Big Gan is trained on a thing called ImageNet, which is um, a like open source image model or image data set. Um, so there's probably some like 100 and maybe 200 images in this data set. So and it's probably all from like the same basketball game. So you know all of these images are looking like pretty pretty similar which is one of the problems I have with Big GAN um, in general. So Big BIGAN, uh, for those of you that use this, the idea behind Big BIGAN is that it looks for the closest representation of, of an image that you provided it in Big GAN. So it's actually trying to like sort of re, like try to find the image inside of the Big GAN model, which is why, again, if you're looking at like collage art, it won't find it because it's trained on mostly photographs. Um, but yeah, so that's how Big GAN works. So the only, these are the only two models that um, support uh, vector inputs and have latent spaces inside of Runway. Um, I don't think there are any other ones up there right now. Cool. So that is it with uh, in regards to vector inputs. Any questions? All right. That's rad. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Okay. So um, let's take the next like 15 minutes or so, and I'll just show you some cool projects of people um, whose work I've, I've followed for a while or either or some, some students of mine. Um, so this is just to give you some ideas on ways in which you can use Runway. So I, I purposely have sort of spec this to be only Runway projects, um, in part because you very likely will see cool ML art being done by other people. Um, and that might not be possible to do inside of Runway. So as I mentioned, Runway is kind of limiting in the sense that like there's only so many models in it. Um, it's hard to do certain things in it, but it, but like what's nice about Runway is it's all the GUI interface you can play with. Um, whereas what a lot of ML artists are doing is writing code and that sort of thing, which you most of you are probably not ready to do yet. So, um, you know, this is just be aware, like Runway is a little bit limiting, but some of the limits are good constraints to actually make cool projects. <coughs> um, so, you know, Brian, you were already playing with mugs and stuff. Um, this is a ceramicist. Um, her name's Fran. Uh, she trained a StyleGAN model on all of her own pottery. Um, so she photographed all her own pottery, fed it through StyleGAN, and it generated all of these new sort of images. And um, this link is links to a blog post that she wrote about, about like 
how it kind of surprised her what what it made and how uh now i don't know when this came out but like now she's actually trying to like make pottery that looks sort of like the model that she was was giving it right so you'll see like some of these models have like these insanely large handles and she's like that's kind of cool like what if i made a, a, a mug that had like a really large handle or um because uh, I believe Runway does mirroring, and we'll talk about this when we talk about data sets. Um, it can sometimes flip images to learn both both sides. Um, you'll see some handle, some of these mugs have two handles, and she's like, well, that'd be cool. Like, what if it had two handles? So, um, you know, this is a common theme that I talk about in this class, which is like, don't just make ML art just to make ML art, right? Like, you can use it to, to do other things with it, right? To generate inspiration or to generate other things you can build off of. Um, so this is just a cool project, and like, you know, this person was like, I don't know anything about machine learning. I'm just a ceramicist, but I thought this was a cool idea. So I played with it. Um, you'll see lots of really interesting color examples, other things as well. Um, Janelle Shane is a really great uh, ML researcher. Um, if you're not familiar with her work, I definitely recommend checking it out. She has just like a really great sense of humor. Um, she wrote a book recently on AI, um, blank on the name of it, but it, she's just really, really funny. She mostly does like She'll train models on like really funny things to show again how like kind of silly AI is, um, but just a really great person. Definitely a good follow on on, uh, on Twitter as well. Um, but this model is uh, this is a model called Deep Spade. Um, so this is this is a little bit of a tough tough one. This is sort of like what Justin was showing, which is it takes motion capture and then it segments out different parts of the image. But instead of uh, just segmenting out different parts of the body. It actually segments out things by object. So it might say like, this is a face or this is a baseball bat or this is a stop sign or other things. So one way is or what this model, what this video essentially does, it takes this Star Wars video, which I'll play in a minute. Um, it segments it out. Then it feeds into another model that takes those segments and re turns them into images. Um, so again, if it says, here's a segment for a baseball bat, it then converts that color code back to a baseball bat. Um, now, the problem here is, and this is what's sort of funny about this is, the two models that do this inside runway do not have the same color coding. So like the color code that converted to a baseball bat converts to like a sword or something else in, in, in the other method. So this is something that Janelle does a lot of, which is sort of like showing how these things don't talk to each other or like makes really funny results when the models aren't perfectly synced up. Oops. So you can just like barely see the outlines of most of the shapes um, and it doesn't do a good job, but it's interesting. And this is again, a case of where like lower your expectations and this looks like a cool, like sort of like super weird horror movie. Um, or, you know, again, think about just like, oh, well, how could I use this and use these constraints to actually generate something that was interesting. Um, yeah, so Janelle's great. Definitely follow her, lots of really cool work. Mostly works in text. This is one of the few things I've seen of hers that uh, is uh, image-based. Um, Fabian Rashid is a really great artist. I believe he's from India. Um, and he made a tool that allows him to do paintings uh, using AI. So this is definitely advanced level. I don't expect anyone in this class to make their own iPad app. Um, but there's a model, there's a bunch of models called Spade inside of Runway um, that allow you to just create solid shapes. And then you can assign those to um, a particular object and it can generate um, images from it. So this is a like a, a landscape image where what he's able to do is, you know, generate uh, using this uh, this pen. He just generates the shapes, and then he assigns it to a, an object, uh, and then it fills in the photographic details of this. Um, I think in week three or maybe week four, we can also look at how to do this using Photoshop. Um, you could also do something like this in, in Photoshop, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. So this is a, a just a really simple. He made a web app that uh, one of the things that we'll look at in week four is we'll look at how to talk to Runway using other applications. So we'll use a web app like called P5JS. Um, to talk to Runway, but you could do a bunch of stuff to talk to Runway. Um, it has an open protocol uh, that you can run across, so it's pretty cool. So Adam is a former student of mine. Um, he is a, a 3D artist as well, so like he made this really cool uh, style game model that's all um, stained glass, and they sort of thought, well, 
what's cooler than stained glass is actually seeing the light through it. So he brought it into, um, I don't know, like C4D or something, and then he rendered it and he used Octane to like do the lighting through it. So um, again, like a really cool, like he took it one step further than just a style game model um, and created this really interesting way of also sort of lighting it and, and showing it off. Um, so again, just like some really nice ways of just taking skills that he already had that I don't have um, and, you know, taking it and applying it to his own work. Um, Andreas Refsgards uh, is uh, one of the people that uses Runway like quite frequently. Um, and I really like his work. Uh, this is um, a style game model trained on uh, daguerreotypes or tintype photo photographs. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about this again when we talk about data sets in just a little bit, but the number of images that are in your data set also kind of determines how your output looks like. So in this case, my guess is he didn't have a whole lot of images. So what ends up happening is you see this sort of like bouncing between different images um, and you get this sort of like distorted figures and other things, um, which is kind of a cool look, but uh, it's not like if a data scientist were to look at this, like they'd be like, oh, this kind of sucks. This is what's called overfitting. Not a good, not a good thing, but like in our perspective, it's fine. Um, so he trained this on black and white photographs. And then there's also a model in, um, in Runway called Deoldify. And what Deoldify does, it takes black and white photos and applies color to them. Um, it's now like a big app. You can like buy it, I think, um, off the internet. I think it's being used um, by a lot of the like historical or like uh, genealogical websites. So you can upload photographs of your family from the 1900s and like see them like recolored. Um, so it's a pretty interesting model. Uh, it basically just takes old photographs and adds color to them. Um, Some is really, really accurate. This one's pretty good. Other times it's like really weird and not accurate at all. So, um, but again, here's a, here's a method where you sort of chaining two ideas together. Um, Nye is another former student of mine. He is like just a crazy motion person. Uh, this was sort of his like demo reel of all the various things he did in like a couple weeks. Um, so I believe this is uh, him taking Beyonce's All the Single Ladies. So that first thing was uh, was using attention GAN to generate images of it. Now he's doing like motion tracking. What else does he have in here? Oh, now he's doing, um, this is a first order motion, uh, which allows you to do like lip syncing. So I, I assume there was like a Beyonce singing, yeah, option and now he's applying it to all these various images. Apparently he also did a style game model. Like I honestly forgot half the stuff he made for this, but he made a ring style game model. Looks like a style transfer model. Um, so this is just like a really cool reel of just like a million and one things that he did all in runway. Um, so yeah, just really, really interesting stuff. He also has a, uh, a uh, Shatner GAN, if anyone's interested in checking out that one, it's pretty cool. Um, Jason Power is another student of mine. Um, he was training his on typography. And I will say StyleGAN does not like typography. Um, it is just like generally like not a good thing to try to feed through a machine learning model. I, I'll talk a little bit about why maybe later, but um, so he got like a really, I don't want to say bad model, but he just wasn't as exciting as he wanted it to be. But what he was able to do is he was able to sort of take the model, which are more of these like blobby shapes, and he superimposed it on the typography they trained it on. And now he made like sort of a typography video with this like uh, blobby shapes on it. So he was able to salvage like kind of maybe an imperfect project into something cool, um, which again, I think many of us will, will, will experience uh, over the next couple weeks. Um, but this is a nice way to sort of like think about how you can like reuse some of these pieces. Um, April is another student of mine and a friend of mine. Um, she uh, often, uh, she likes to travel a lot. So she would go travel and then she would take her sketch notebook with her and she would sketch buildings. Um, so what this is actually is this is a model trained on, she actually like reconstructed a data set that was her sketch in the bottom two thirds and then a photograph of what she was sketching above it. So she actually went through Google and like crawled and like found the image and like pasted it in. Um, and this is, I've, I've never seen anyone do this before, but I thought it was really, really cool that um, she fed the, the data set, both her image and the sketch sort of in one image. Um, and then when it started generating style again images, it generated sort of like the re return of this, which is like the sketch at the bottom and then what it would expect the photograph to look like above it. Um, and sometimes it matches up fairly well, right? Like uh, this one's sort of interesting in that it's like clearly like a beach sort of painting and maybe it's a beach above it. Um, you know, some of the structures like the column structures match so like the model's able to learn like even like sort of bilateral motion if you want to call it that or something um yeah so like it's just really really interesting to sort of see this happen 
Um, she also trained another model just on her sketches. And then she fed them back through a pen platter to like redraw them. Um, so again, here's another thing of like, take this, do one thing with it, and then take it in one other step and find something else to do with it. So um, she's sort of able to like recreate her own sketches from, from this model. Um, so that's a bunch of the projects I have. Um, there's also like, uh, we often do like show and tells through, through other classes. So um, I'll also link to some other um, class show and tells from previous sessions. So if anyone's interested in seeing more work or just sort of sort of seeing what other people make, I'll happy make the happily make those available to people. Um, but these are just a couple of my favorite projects that I've seen throughout the years on runway. Um, and obviously, like in a five week class, I don't expect anyone to like go all the way and like do all this stuff. But um, maybe it just inspires you to keep going, or like if you want to like if you've got time right now, like you want to dig in, um, please feel free. Like I think there's lots of cool stuff uh, available to you here. Uh, any questions? Cool. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Oh, I, I was just going to quickly ask about the um, typography issue and the bubbling. Is it yeah. just that it's because it's catching the edges and rather than the context of the text itself, it begins to like mush everything together? Because I know one thing I'm thinking about is training a style again on my like notebooks, which has writing in it, like as yeah. part of the thing. So yeah, so it's exactly that. Writing is like a very complicated topic in the, in the sense of like, a photograph of small text um, often just turns into mushy textures in the way that StyleGAN interprets it. Um, trying to do text also because runway by default mirrors images, and then it then you've got text that is both read one way and mirrored, and it just like it sort of like all falls apart. I'll also say that uh, it is a challenge um, to use flat black and white vectors inside of StyleGAN. So remember, most of these models are meant for photographs. So uh, when you put this work into photographic work or whatever, like it just is a challenge and it like, or when you take flat vectors and put them into, into a photographic model, it tends to try to turn them into gradients or photographs. Um, so actually someone who I didn't post in here, but I definitely should have um, is Esteban, who's another student of mine. Um, and he often shares his work in, let me see, the share projects channel. Yep. Um, so he, he does, he generates his own um, data sets using uh, vector graphics. Let's see if I have a good example of one of his here. Well, here's more of Jason's work. Um, doing other stuff. Uh, yeah, here's a good example of um, Esteban's work. So these are all flat vector graphics. Um, like really flat colors, but you'll see like they they still main they still get texture on them. Um, that's because these models are really meant to find texture and to find edges and that sort of thing. So um, it becomes a real challenge. Like now this looks really good. This is like a nice effect, um, but I think he it took him a while to sort of figure out how to like fine tune all of that. Um, so it is a bit of a challenge working with vectors, but you will sometimes get cool stuff out of it. Rad, thanks. Yeah. Um, cool. So if there's no more questions, why don't we take a quick break and then we'll, we'll come back and dive into a couple other things. Sound good? All right. So why don't we come back at eight, 801 or whatever 01 is for you, wherever you are. All right. I will see everyone in five minutes.
All right. Um, anyone have any additional questions over break? Cool, so let me quickly show you how to use chaining. So um, chaining is essentially using multiple models all at once or like in one sort of workflow. Um, this is actually like one of my favorite parts of runway and it's very, very hard to do outside of runway. Um, so it's worth taking advantage of um, inside of runway. So um, let's actually just start with uh, some models here. So um, the way to do chaining is all of your models have to be the, in the same workspace. So let's actually start with, let, let's do a tension GAN. And let's just, um, I'm gonna click in here. Uh, that's fine. And then- Derek, I don't think you're sharing screen yet. I'm not, thank you. Cool, okay. So um, all I did so far is workspace. So um, I'm just gonna build up a couple, man, I'm really having problems here today. Um, so I'm just gonna build up a couple models inside of a workspace. So I'm gonna start with attention again. Um, so we'll we'll use a text input here. Um, we'll go back to bot models and let's use big by GAN again. So again, remember that this takes the image, we feed it, and it tries to find the closest representation of it inside of um, the big GAN model. So we'll add this here. And then let's do one more model. So I said I would show how to do uh, a higher resolution output. So um, we're going to go to I believe it's post processing. Yeah. So um, there's this model called SRFBN, which is uh, image super resolution. There's also another one here called super resolution. I don't actually really know the difference between these two. Um, I'll just go with this one's got more runs. So let's just use this. We'll add this to our workspace as well. Okay, so I've got three models here. Um, what I need to do is now I need to start hooking them up together. So the important part is to remember that your output of your previous model has to match the input of your next model. Um, so an attention GAN. Um, my input is text, my output is going to be an image. So in big by GAN, my output or my input is going to be an image and my output is also going to be an image. So um, if I were to try to reverse these, where big by GAN's output is an image, but the input for attention GAN is a, a piece of text, that won't work because um, they just don't match. Um, so what I can do inside of big by GAN is in here, what I would usually choose um, a file or a camera, I can actually set my input to be attention GAN itself. So we'll actually set that to be the input. Um, so attention GAN is still going to run text. It's going to output. It's that output is going to go to big by GAN, and then I'm going to take the output from big by GAN, which is going to be 256 by 256. Um, big by GAN is very small. Might be 512 by 512. Um, either way, I, I know it's small. And then we're going to feed it into image super resolution, and the input for this is going to be big by GAN. So now all my setup is hooked up. Um, I'll, I'll, one thing I want to do over here is just make sure I'm going to set this to 4x. Um, I personally, what I found works best for super resolution is if you're going to go 4x, you actually do 2x and another 2x. Um, you just get more texture out of it, I find personally, but maybe play with it and see what you think. I'm going to set this to be 4x. Um, I believe this is already set up to work the way it's, I want it to. So um, one thing to note is that when you run three models at once, you'll be charged for three models. So if it's five cents per minute, you're going to be charged 15 cents per minute. So just be aware of that it's like, it gets expensive. Um, I think this max is out at like five. You can't run more than five models at once. Um, it'd be pretty crazy if you if you did, but just be aware of that. Um, so uh, there's a nice little handy feature in here. If you hover over the name of your workspace and you go click on the ellipses, there is a start all models. This is just going to kick off all models getting running. Looks like this one's already set up. This one is starting and this one is starting. Um, so I can just go in here. So let's just type some text in here. Um, So this is the big red dog ran from the car. There is no dog in there, but that's all right. Um, so we're going to take this image, right? So this image is now going to show up in this model. And once this processes, this is what we found. So it's really like the dog is running from the boat, I guess. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, so this output size, let's just see. So the output is 256 by 256. Um, and then when we hit on image super resolution, what's our issue here? I don't know why that got an error. Let's see. 
There we go. So now my output is 1024 by 1024. So if I hit save image and I save this down and I click on it. So you'll see, you know, it's not the best quality, but again, it like we were also like doing a bunch of degrading to it to begin with. Um, it'd probably be worse in Photoshop or more blurry in Photoshop. Some images do well, others don't. Um, this might also just not, I, the other model might be the one that I would go with SRFBN. Um, so you can now like change this. So let's say uh, the big red dog ran from the ship. So let's just see, there's our new ship, there's our new boat, and there's a new high rise output. So this is kind of a cool way, like literally to do this outside of runway is like the biggest pain in the ass. You have to like run like three different models you got to get them all set up. You've got to like move files around. It is a huge pain in the ass. So this is a very, very nice feature. Kind of limited use, like right, like you have to sort of figure out exactly what your what your tool chain is. But like it, it is pretty interesting. Um, and other times, I think I've done something. Oh, there's a, okay. So let's do another thing. Um, I'm gonna hit stop all my models here. I'll show you one other trick, which gets very weird very quickly. Um, stop. Did I stop? It did stop. So I'm gonna remove my image super resolution by just deleting it. And let's come back to back to models. So I'm gonna look for one called M to text. So what does M to text do? So M to text takes an image and produces a text caption from it. So you might be able to guess what I'm gonna to start to do here. I am going to switch my output here. So we're now going to create a like sort of feedback loop. Um, I actually don't know how this is gonna work. Let me see. I actually think I need to switch this around a little bit um, because I need to start with an image that I can actually feed it. Um, oh, this I can do. Let's see if this works. Um, so we're going to start with this. So we'll take this as a file and put, how did I do this before? I honestly don't remember how I did this before. I know I've done this before. I've definitely done it in other classes, um, but there should be a way, I, you know, I maybe just did it manually. So if I'm going to hit run, run all, um, start all models, So this generated an image. These are still running here. Come on. There we go. So uh, I fed it a piece of text again. So I fed it the big red, the big red, the big red dog ran from the ship. Um, I got a new ship, which is somehow now converted to like what looks like a tanker um, or a tank. And now I get a new piece of text that says a black and white photo of an old airplane. This is like a game of telephone, right? So now I'm going to take this, I'm going to paste this in here. Uh, and now I get a black and white photo of an, air, of an old airplane. Uh, I get something that looks like a weird whale uh, or a baby elephant. So I get a baby elephant. A baby elephant standing next to a baby elephant. Okay, sure, why not? Let's see what let's see if we can make this. Right, I see the elephant. Now it's a cheetah or a brown and white dog and a black and white dog. So again, this is sort of a fun way like uh, to just create these sort of like looping structures, right? Um, I feel like I definitely had gotten this to do like a, a feedback loop where it automated and it actually like kind of like stopped working after like a minute because it just like, ended up in the exact same image loop. Like this is sort of the problem with a lot of these feedback loops, you can't really control them. Um, but anyway, this is like the fun of chaining. Um, I could probably spend like an hour doing this for sure. Um, but yeah. Could you could you chain into text back to itself? Uh, you couldn't because into text, its output is a piece of text and its mm -hmm. input is an image. So you have to is match up. Is there a up. text to in? Well, that's sort of what attention GAN is, right? Um, okay, so okay. you could actually like, just sort of, you could remove this step entirely, um, delete. And then if you just have into text, you would just set this to be attention again. Um, and I think, let's see if this runs. That's running, it's running. And then I wanna see if maybe this is how I did it. Oh, see this thing stopped. Okay, yeah, so here we go. So this is now like sort of like feedbacking, feedback looping itself, but it kind of hits a point where like this probably, this image kept repeating the same 
image. So you get into like this place where it sort of breaks. Um, okay. Sometimes you can get this to run for a while and you actually see it running. Um, you'll see it just keeps repeating back the same text in the image that it found, but it is running. Um, mm. Yeah, so there's there's lots of ways you can sort of play with feedback loops within this. Um, I just think this is a cool thing that you definitely like this. I wish I could do this with everything outside of runway, um, but it's pretty hard. So there's some, some nice opportunities here to like just sort of build up a, a little bit of a workflow. So that's chaining. Um, you're welcome to play with it. Uh, we, I think we'll look at, so I probably won't cover it uh, in this class, but there is a way to like basically build web apps using Runway. So if you wanted to build like a very complicated sort of tool chain where someone could like just feed uh, your web app a uh, piece of text and get back like a high resolution image, um, you could do that uh, using that system. I have a video on that and I'll probably just like put the video in a slide deck and sort of say like, hey, this thing exists if you want to do it. Um, it's pretty expensive. Like I think it's one cent per request, uh, which, so if, you're, if your site gets put on Reddit, you will like end up losing thousands of dollars. So, um, you know, it, but it's, it's a cool feature if you want to play with it. And it's also good for like, I can say a cool thing if you have like a graduate, if you're like a show or something you're going to do for a couple hours, you can just turn the model on and let people have fun and then like turn it off at night. And, you know, it's a cool, cool thing to do. Um, but I do have a video on how to set that up if anyone's interested. Um, but I probably won't cover it in this class just because, again, it, it does get pretty expensive for folks. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's cool things you can do with inside Runway. Um, so yeah, that covers it for Runway. Um, any other questions before I jump into making your own data sets? All right, cool. So let's talk data sets. So um, not next week, but the week after, um, I am going to cover how to train your model inside Runway using a style game model. So, um, Basically, to train your own style game model, that means you need a data, you need a data set. Um, and so this is sort of the most challenging part of this class is making a data set. Um, run or style again, I would say in general, a good number to shoot for is 500 images. Um, so that's quite a lot to find, um, depending on what you want to do. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how to make a data set. Um, I've got a couple different options for folks, depending on how um, how hungry you are to install software on your computer. Um, and we'll talk a little about scraping and some other things as well. So um, we'll just start talking a little bit about what data sets are and how to make them and where to find them, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, data sets are sort of like the lifeblood as, as I'm sure you've now figured out like playing with these models, like understanding what data sets someone's trained on is really, really important. And also when you wanna make your own data set, it's like, I, or like when you make your own style game model, you don't really want to use someone else's data set. You want to use your own, or like you want to find a cool data set to play with, right? So um, that's what we're going to sort of talk about. Is just like how to go about doing that, how to clean up your data set, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a couple options here for data sets. Um, obviously, there are some pre-made ones out there, and I'll link to a couple if anyone's interested. Um, you can download a pre-made data set of faces or other things. Um, you can have at it. Uh, one thing that I'll probably recommend folks do is we'll we'll talk a little bit about web scraping, which means you can like scrape using a uh, some Chrome plugins or other things to just download a whole bunch of images from someone's Instagram page or from a Pinterest page, um, that sort of thing. That's usually the one that I think most people get into or like are excited by because it's a little bit easier than like having to scan or photograph your own work um, or that sort of thing, but you can totally do that too. Um, so obviously like scanning and photographing and collecting images one by one is pretty time intensive. Uh, you could probably do 500 in the next two weeks. I, I'm sure you could, um, but it is a very intense process. So just be aware like if you want to do that, like set aside some time to do that. Uh, so what I usually recommend is if you're just going to try to find a, a data set, like either off the internet or whatever, like first thing is just, just do a Google search. Um, so if you do a Google search for shoes data set, uh, I know you'll find a number of shoe data sets. Um, I think Zappos has one, a bunch of other companies have one. So like a lot of these companies will make data sets because they have a machine learning team that needs to determine the color of their shoes or like, you know, wants to categorize, are these women's shoes, men's shoes, who's gonna buy these these types of shoes, that sort of thing. Um, and often they'll make their data public um, because they have the photographs of them or whatever. Um, so if you are looking for some like shoes data set, I'm sure you could find a couple. One thing to be a little bit aware of is like, you have to worry about resolution. So style GAN for many of us, we probably want the highest resolution possible, right? So that means 1024 by 1024. Um, many of the shoe data sets you'll find on the internet are gonna be like 256 by 256 or 512 by 512. Um, so it can be a bit of a challenge to like find a good pre-made data set that's also the resolution you want. Uh, you might be able to find it, but it's gonna be a bit of a challenge. There are many sort of like well-known famous data sets. Um, most of them you won't care about or want. If you wanna check out some of the links to some of these, they exist. 
Um, ImageNet is probably the most popular one. It's like very, very famous. Um, it's one that most data science teams use because it's available to them. It's also really large. I think it's something like 100,000 images. Uh, there's something like 1,000 categories. Actually, it might need more than 100,000 images. Uh, but there's like 1,000 categories. Uh, this is actually quite literally where horses and zebras came from. Uh, there's a horse category and a zebra category. Someone pulled out those two categories and then did horses to zebras. Um, so yeah, that's like there's a ton of stuff in here. Um, I think you might have to log in to create an account to download this or like be related to school. It's it's a little there's all sorts of weird restrictions around these things because to be honest, a lot of these are not they like scrape this stuff from the internet, just stole stuff outright. Like there's definitely like some questionable legal and ethical situations with a lot of these things. Um, Cypher 10 has long been like the most famous one. Uh, Cypher 10 is like 70 by 70 images, so you won't really want to use that one. Uh, MNIST is um, how uh, banks are able to read your handwriting. Um, this is a kind of this is a data set of all handwritten digits. Um, and it's like a famous sort of test to make sure that your models work. Um, FHQ actually is what uh, the StyleGAN model is trained on. This is uh, FF is uh, Flickr faces high quality. So this is one that is trained to 1024 by 1024. Um, this is if you look at the default StyleGAN model instead of runway, which is faces. Um, it's that's what's the model. That's what the model is. Um, so if you want faces, you can grab those from there. Someone's already trained this model, so like I probably wouldn't recommend like grabbing any of these because someone's already trained them on these, and you can probably just find them. Slebe is another famous faces one. Um, it's a little bit older. Uh, they skirted copyright law because it's all celebrities, and you can do anything with a celebrity's face. Um, funny thing is, this is all from like uh, the early two thousands. So George Bush is like something like five or ten percent of the data set in this. Um, so yeah, uh, this is, this is, I mean, like, so, so also like, this is a good moment for me to touch on some ethical things. Like you'll hear a lot of people talk about data sets and how they're biased or how there's other problems with them. Uh, this is what they're talking about, right? Like this is a data set from two that started in like 2004 or whatever. And like, guess who the most famous celebrity was in the United States at that time, the president. So like, you know, it's a lot of white people cause most celebs are white. It's a lot of other, other issues. Um, this is a problem with data sets that are trained to like, or meant to do real things in the real world. Um, one of the nice things about being an artist is like, you can choose a weird data set and no one's going to be like, what are, what are the, what's the biases in your weird data set? Um, you know, but just be aware of that. Steve, do you have a question? No. Okay. Um, there's also another one called label faces in the wild. Faces are very, very popular. Uh, facial detection. Um, Jaring faces is like a cool demo, like lots of things. So lots of face data sets. If you want faces, you're in good, you're in, you're in luck. Um, this is a really cool list of public image data sets that are available. Um, this was put together by Golan Levin, um, who's a teacher at CMU. And it's like sort of like openly contributed to by other people. Um, so there's a list of a bunch of images, like image collections here. Um, Many of them are not downloadable in the sense that there's like a download button, but you'll have to like figure out how to scrape them. If you're interested in scraping for one of these, just let me know. Um, I'm happy to sort of like work with you and try to figure out how to do that. Um, but there's lots of cool, cool data sets to play with. Um, nice thing here is that there is an image count sort of like listed by, by many of them. So if you want to sort of like, uh, I don't know, if you want to use like a, a, a hundred seven million images, um, you can do that. Uh, I don't recommend trying to train a style game model on 7 million images. It just won't work that well. Um, I would sort of say like realistically what I would hope you, that you would shoot for bare minimum, you need about 500, anything less than 500, you're going to run into issues. Um, we can go up to about like 5,000. I mean, go up to 70,000. That's something or an FHQ. Um, it just, I don't expect many of you to be able, I don't expect anyone, including myself to be able to like gather seven, 70,000 images in two weeks, unless you've got one of these data sets to download from. So just be aware of that. Um, but I'd say, if you do 500 to 5,000, like that's a that's a good number. That's a good range to sort of shoot for. Um, okay, so those are public data sets. They're things probably people have already found. You very likely want to do something cooler or like more unique. Um, when you want to do something more unique, you end up getting into the world of scraping. Um, so scraping is generally like running through a web page and just downloading all the images on the web page or doing other more dynamic things like taking someone's Instagram handle and being able to scrape all their stuff um, or being able to go through the Flickr search API and be able to download things from there. Um, so there's a couple options here. So each of these links out to a video um, where I have a demo if you want to go through this and, and, and some of these need to be installed on your local computer. Some of them are Chrome extensions, other things 
Um, but there are some options here to download a bunch of different images. I would say if you are very reticent about installing software or like using the command line, um, take a look at the Pinterest one. I actually think Pinterest is like a cool place to download images from um, just because I think there's options. And I think also a Pinterest does sort of like a related image search. You get a nice mix of images. Um, we'll look at the Instagram scraper tutorial. Um, obviously one of the downsides of Instagram scraper is that you could steal someone's entire like Instagram account of images. And like, well, I think that's very cool and very interesting. It has some ethical questions there. Um, so generally what I recommend is like maybe try to take, if you're gonna do like artwork or whatever, take from a couple different artists who might have a similar style but are a little different. Cause then at least you're sort of like mishmashing stuff together in a model and it's more like collage than it is like just taking someone's whole 20 year catalog of artwork or whatever. So um, just be aware of that. So um, I will cover, I'll do a really quick demo of the Instagram scraper tutorial um, for anyone who's interested. Cause I tend to find one of the nice things about Instagram is its images are 1080 by 1080 which it turns out is like a really decent size for 1024 by 1024. Um, and it's pretty easy. Like you just need to know a user's name or a hashtag and you can scrape a bunch of images off of it. So it's, it's fairly straightforward. There is some installation of, of software, but I have a video for that if you're interested um, in doing that. So I generally say Pinterest, Instagram, Flickr, those are good things. If you have like a website or something that you like want to custom scrape stuff from, um, Obviously this isn't a class about coding, but I'm happy to like, if it seems doable, I can write a little scraper for people um, to download images from if they have something in mind. Um, I, most people don't ask me for that because it's usually just like, I'll just use Instagram or whatever and it's fine. Um, but I'm happy to talk through things if you have other examples of something in mind. Um, cool, so Instagram scraper. So I'll do a quick Instagram scraper demo. Um, you do have to install some software beforehand. Um, so these are, the three, these are the three things you need to install. Um, I have a video that walks you through the entire process. I won't go through that process now because it does take about 30 minutes. Um, this is the recommended process. If you're on a Mac, like please, please, please make sure you install Anaconda. If you don't install Anaconda, you will get into a nightmare world. Um, so please follow this video step-by-step. Step. I'm happy to walk people through it if they have questions, um, but it gets really, really gnarly. Uh, the data sets tools library is something that I've made. This allows you to sort of resize things and do cropping and other things that are really nice. This is kind of optional because Runway also has some, some tools to do this. We'll cover some of this stuff next in two weeks. Um, Runway will sort of like, you can throw an image, at, you can throw images at all sorts of weird sizes at Runway and I'll sort of figure it out. Um, so if you have a bunch of rectangular images that are like 1024 by 512, um, Runway will sort of like automatically just assume you want a square crop from the center and just sort of like crop and resize things. Um, it's not ideal because it can lead to blurriness in your model, but if you just want to throw stuff at the model, it's totally fine. Um, I generally am like, I'm a little bit more of a nitpicker and I will like make sure my crop is exactly what I want, that sort of thing, but yeah. Darren, quick question. Um, yeah. You mentioned challenges related to Mac. How does that look on PC? Uh, whew, I think it should be better because the problem is on a PC, you might need to install Python, which is like a whole other thing. Um, if you're on a PC and I would say start with this and see how it goes. And if you have questions, let me know. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and lastly, you do need to install this tool called Instagram Scraper, which is like a command line tool. Um, again, I don't expect anyone to like have to use the command line or want to use the command line. Um, but if you do, like if, you, if you're not one of those people, I would probably recommend checking out the Pinterest tools or the Google Images tools. Um, but if you want to try Instagram scraping and you're just like a little nervous about command line, like just talk to me and we can, we can set up some time to walk through a demo. Um, okay, so the basic uses of Instagram scraper, I'm gonna switch over to um, my command line here now um, is, so the first thing you're gonna to to do is you're gonna do this thing, uh, which is just setting up your, make my screen a little bit bigger here so everyone can see this. Is that big enough? Is that readable for people? Cool, okay. Um, so, uh, this is not a terminal demo, but the video goes into more detail on how this all works. Um, but the first thing we just need to do is uh, set up our environment or make sure we're using the right environment. Uh, Instagram scraper. Uh, so you'll just see that in the front here, it says Instagram scraper. That just means I'm using the right tools and everything. Um, so the really basic, basic version of how this works is you just type in Instagram scraper. Also, if, <coughs> excuse me, if you've never used uh, the terminal before um, on a Mac, you just uh, look for a terminal and it's just an, an application that uh, will open. And it looks like this, like the hacker, the hacker tool, it's all code. Um, 
So you just type in Instagram scraper and then you can type in a username. Um, maybe you didn't know that your whole Instagram could be scraped, but it can be. Um, so I'm just going to go to Instagram really quickly and I'm going to, I'm going to find like an artist or someone whose work I like, I'll probably build a, a custom data set for, um, for a couple weeks from now too, just cause I, it's always fun to just sort of, I don't know why if I'm making data sets fun, but I do, um, I was actually looking at this person's work, um, earlier today. So, uh, this person makes really cool, like 3d collages, um, so I think I'll try to find some other geometric collage type stuff and maybe just combine a couple artists and, and we'll see if we can make like a cool little uh, model out of this. So um, really all you do is you just copy their name and then you paste their name in here and you hit return. And this will just start scraping all their images and start downloading them. Um, I believe it will download to yeah, so it's just going to create a folder here that's just called Connie Gozel Schmidt. And they all just start downloading. Cool. Um, so that runs. Uh, one thing to note is so you can also uh, scrape hashtags. And the way to scrape a hashtag, I believe, is. Yeah, so you can also scrape multiple accounts at once just by doing comma separated. Um, you can also uh, scrape tags. So uh, if you wanted to scrape a hashtag, let's, let's just do. I found out this week that, or like I was trying to do this, I was trying to prep for this earlier today. And I found out that uh, Instagram turned off hashtag search because of disinformation, which is like the most ridiculous thing. Uh, I can't imagine who's putting disinformation on geometric art, but so be it. Um, so I can't really see what my results are. One of the things I would probably recommend is like, hopefully you could check this out and sort of see what your images might look like. Um, one thing to be aware of is when you search a hashtag, you will get a lot of crap and clutter. Um, which means you'll probably have to manually like go through it and like start removing stuff you don't want. Um, what's nice about scraping an artist is uh, guess what? They, they photographed everything in the sort of exact lighting or the same way, uh, which makes it really, really nice for a data set. Um, but obviously it's a little bit of an ethical problem. Um, so the way to scrape uh, a hashtag is just to go Instagram dash scraper, and then you do dash dash tag, and then you just paste in the tag without uh, the hashtag in it. And I can't spell because my actually my keyboard is stuck in. And I already, I already did the number one thing I don't recommend you do, which is um, you want to make sure you set a max count on your uh, how many files you download. So dash dash maximum and then a number, um, because if you start downloading from something that has like a million images, it will download a million images to your computer um, and it will take forever. So I definitely recommend setting a maximum. I'll set a maximum of 1,000 um, just for this. Oh, interesting. What happened there? Oh, weird. I wonder if they even turned off API search. There's literally just those images. Oh, wow, they might have broken this. That's amazing. I didn't even think about that. Um, OK, so maybe maybe uh, hashtag searching doesn't work or scraping right now. Um, so maybe you'll just actually want to go in and like, let's say I like this artist. Um, I might just click on their name um, and see if they've got 280 some posts. Uh, and I might need to just like start downloading some of theirs. Um, that's a fun little thing I didn't even think was going to happen. Wow, I feel like Instagram are, I don't know, that's Pretty, pretty terrible if that's how you fix this information just by breaking your entire application. Um, but anyway, <laughs> okay, so we've got a data set here, right? So, um, and obviously this is like not, not the world's best data set. Uh, you know, I will definitely fill this out more so that it's not just one artist because it would feel pretty terrible if I were scraping just one artist's work and turning it into a, a machine learning model. You know, I will say like machine learning models are pretty crappy. So like, it's not like I'm recreating their work and I could go and sell it because also like, this person sells real 3D artwork. I can't just sell images of it. But again, like it, it is sort of like something to think about, right? Like whose work am I using? How am I using it? What's my purpose? I do this a lot for demos and things. Like I'm not usually like selling this artwork, um, but it's worth just to consider like, you know, how would I feel if my own work were taken and like put through a machinery model? Like I would probably think it was cool, but like maybe, other, maybe others wouldn't. Um, so uh, one thing to note about these images, right? Is like, um, I bet if I double click in here, 
Um, and maybe this artist doesn't do it, but a lot of people put videos up, right? Or they put other things in there. Uh, they have photos of their cats or their kids. Um, so just scraping a data set is not, is not, it's not gonna be good enough. Um, that's the first challenge you will sort of face um, is that, you know, so here's a great example. Um, they took a photo of, you know, the birthplace of Elvis Presley or whatever. Like this clearly shouldn't be in my data set. So here's where we get into like uh, a real data set problem, which is like, if you wanna create data sets at scale, um, you are either talking building tools to like automate, like figuring out what images to keep, or you're talking about like doing a ton of manual process, right? Um, so like we can actually start to feel like maybe we're like a little Facebook, right? Like we don't wanna hire 50 people to uh, scrape, to like clean up our images. Um, so how do we solve this? So this is where uh, I have some tools that are called data set tools. Um, and I'll walk you just through like a really basic steps of how I sort of use it. Um, but essentially this is like a way to get you halfway of the way that you need to be. Um, it won't be perfect, but it's gonna get you like, it helps automate certain things um, that are that are gonna be a pain in the ass to do completely manually, right? So let's say that I actually had this, uh, let's say I had 5,000 images in here. I really realistically don't wanna click through all 5,000 images one by one uh, and like check the size of them, check to see what the image is, maybe check to see if they're duplicates. Um, so one thing to be aware of with Instagram is like lots of people post daily and they don't post new art daily. They just like take an old image and repost it or they take a screenshot of their old uh, images and repost it. Um, you know, and this is, this is humans make data sets and this is like the challenge of these things. Um, also, if you've been on Instagram for a while, you know that back in the day, they didn't have 1080p images. They had 640 by 640. Um, so if you wanna make a 1024 by 1024 model, you probably don't want those small images. And the reason you don't want those small images is because uh, you can put them in runway and runway will process them. It'll just like make them bigger and make them fit to 1024 by 1024. But again, then you've got that bilinear like interpolation where it actually like starts to get uh, noisy or it starts to get blurry. Um, and you realistically might not want some, some things like that. So um, this is just one of the many, many challenges of these things. Um, one thing I should also mention, I feel like I'm probably skipping this a little bit. Um, what we're going to look at when we use StyleGAN in Runway is we're probably going to create some sort of like noisy imagery, sort of like, like I think those the Simpsons example is a great example of how like it's not really perfect, right? Um, you will see StyleGAN models that appeal posted that look beautiful and they look perfect. And uh, it's mostly faces. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that um, the way you build your data set uh, implies a lot into what the model should look for. So if you look at, um, actually, I'm gonna pull this up really quickly because I think it's really helpful to just sort of see it in action. Um, so let's see here. Oops. Not that image. So these are, I believe, all fake images um, using StyleGAN. So this is FFHQ. Uh, now you might look at this and say, wow, like the, the quality of these images is really, really good, right? One of the things that they did that sort of tricks you, in, and if you watch an interpolation video of this, it looks really, really cool. One of the tricks they did is all the, all the eyes line up perfectly. So all the eyes are like perfectly lined up and they're at the exact same point. So basically when you watch a morph, the morph is always the eyes are consistent in their placement and the morph happens around the eyes. And that is sort of like a, if, if you want to create like a really perfect interpolation, that is one of the tricks is find a point where things don't change and keep that consistent and then move everything around it. So you can almost think about it like if you were to take this and like almost onion scan your images over top of each other, there should be a place they line up. That is really, really, really hard to do. And in fact, they wrote a tool to just like read image faces and be able to do that. Um, most of us won't have that tool to like use with our own artwork. Um, so the challenge becomes, do you want to try to do that manually or are you okay with just like having some noise? Like, I think that, um, that brutalist architecture model that I showed is a good example, right? It still looks pretty architectural, but like in some places it's like kind of weird, right? And that's sort of like, maybe you like that as an artistic style, um, or maybe you're just like, that's cool, whatever. I don't really want to do that much work to make a perfect data set. Um, but that's sort of like one thing to just be aware of is like, the noisier or the more diverse your data set is, the likely your more noisier or weird your actual model will be. Um, so here they sort of like 
hid a lot of that by doing some really, really perfect, like all these faces are more or less cropped to the exact same size. And if you were to overlay them on your skin, they would look almost like they perfectly lined up. Um, so just be aware, like that is how you get a really, really perfect looking model. Um, most of us don't have that available to us. So when you're scraping images, that might be something you want to think about, right? So let's say you're scraping like fall leaves. You might want to have something where like the, the stem of the leaf always aligns because then it will always sort of like everything else will happen around that, that stem. Um, whereas with a lot of these photos, like these photos that I have here, like I don't really know what I could line stuff up on, right? Like I could maybe sort of like make sure they're all centered uh, and that would do something. Um, but there's just a lot of challenges to like just sort of doing that um, with a more diverse and especially artistic data set. So just be aware that like we probably will be getting more noisy and more weird stuff, but you will still get interesting results out of those. Okay, that was a bit of a, of a sidetrack, but I just want to talk a little bit about just being aware that like quality is, is dependent a lot on your data set. Um, so the, the process that I usually go through in data set tools is the first thing I do is I throw out all the images that are too small. Um, you don't need to do this uh, because again, Runway will up res images that don't match the size it's looking for. Um, but I would say starting with small images is, or throwing out small images just sort of gives you a sense of like how big your data set is. Um, so I won't do any of the coding here. Um, I've, th again, this is sort of covered in, in many of these demos, um, but I'll just sort of walk through the steps that I, that I go through with this stuff. So in this case, um, this is me. Uh, I did actually make this model uh, last class or the class before, which is on one of my favorite Instagram cats, um, Bone Bone. So when I scraped Bone Bone's account, um, I got 2,089 items. Um, there were a lot of images in there and I thought, this is perfect. I have so many images, it's gonna be great. And the first thing I did is uh, I threw out all the small images. Um, so I threw out anything that was, and this is the command you can run in terminal if you're interested. So I basically said anything that's smaller than 1024, just remove it. Um, and what did I end up with? I end up with 1,130 images. So immediately it threw out over almost half of my data set. Uh, this will be very, very common, um, especially if you're using Instagram and accounts that have been around for a long time because older accounts did have that 640 by 640 uh, size. So just be aware that like, uh, if you start with like 2000 images, uh, or let's say you start with like 750 images and you're like, I wanna get to the 500 threshold. If you run this and the first thing that happens is you drop to 300, uh, you should decide if you wanna just like, sort of deal with having some blurry images in your data set, or if you wanna go find more images, um, sort of up to you. Um, and I would say it's like kind of dependent on the data set, how easy it is, how easy is it to find other images? Um, so the way I just sort of like, I run this, uh, it shrinks my data set size down to 1,130 items. Then I start to actually look through. So once I've run this, I actually start to look through the data set. Um, I might just pick a random sampling and just sort of open them one by one or like use the preview. Um, and you'll sort of see like, here's what my data set looks like, right? So obviously I found some images that are small, um, but there's also images in here that are like these sort of triplet images or like, I don't know, grid of images, which I don't want. Um, there's also very likely, because uh, Bone Bone is famous and lots of people want their photo taken with Bone Bone, um, there is also like photos of weird humans. And I don't really care about that. I care about Bone Bone. Um, so the next step also, like sometimes you'll find duplicates. So again, this happens very commonly with Instagram where someone uploads like an ins uh, same image, like, you know, just to keep their daily uh, posting going or whatever. Um, so you can run a dedupe script. Um, there is a dedupe script that I have included in data set tools. Um, two things to know about dedupe. So there's one way to do dedupe, which just literally looks for the exact same image, meaning if all the pixels match up exactly, uh, it removes one of the duplicates. Um, but like I said, what a lot of people will do is they will take a screenshot of their old photo, repost the screenshot. And because of JPEG compression that's run on Instagram, uh, you now have a different image technically. So there is a second version of this, which I cover so I have like a whole YouTube playlist of data set tools, um, demos, if you're interested. Uh, there's another tool that will actually look for similar images that are not pixel by pixel perfect matches. Um, so I might recommend running that because that is um, more likely to remove any duplicates. The downside of that is it can take a long time to run. Uh, so if you run that on a thousand images, it might take like overnight to run. Uh, it might take like a couple hours because it's really processor intensive. So just be aware of that. Um, all this is like sort of like what's the balance of like how perfect do I want my data set to be versus how much time do I want to spend. So in this case, when I ran this duplicates, it only found two images that were duplicates. So I'm still in a good area. Um, next was literally I had to go in and hand curate it. So like at some point you end up hand curating this stuff. It just sort of ends up being what you have to do. Um, so in this case, these are actually two different images, but like it's like 
you sort of see it as like one of those burst photos, right? Where like slightly different angle or slightly different picture. Um, maybe my DDIP script didn't catch this. So now it's like, do I want to delete it? Do I not? So like, is like, how close am I to that bottom threshold of images that I have? Like that sort of thing. Um, but you will always end up doing some hand curation. And the, the deal is you want to get it as small as possible before doing that hand curation. Um, because hand curation is a pain in the ass and it takes a long time to do. Um, so even like, so here's just some, a sampling of like the images that were in my data set, right? Um, so here's again, a photo of a crowd. I don't really want crowds in my, in my photos because if I really wanna just recreate Bone Bone's face, um, this crowd is gonna get messy. Now, the truth is if I leave one or two of these photos in my data set, it's fine. Like if I sort of think about these, like a data set as being an average of all the images you want out of it. And like, if there's a couple crowd images, that's gonna get pushed out to that outside area of the latent space, because um, they're very different. Um, so if you leave, if you miss a couple, like it's not the end of the world, but ideally you want to remove as much as possible. Um, so, you know, I really wanted to recreate pictures of Bones and Bones faces. Um, so I sort of found these paws and I was sort of like, I don't really want paws, so I would delete those. Um, likewise, I want real Bone Bone, not some like fake Bone Bone with a mustache, so I'd remove those as well. So when I, I think when I did this, I got down to like 950 or whatever, and that's fine. Like that's a totally, totally fair number. Um, the next step you need to think about is uh, these will all be square crops. Um, so when you crop an image to square, you have to think about how do I actually go about doing that? Uh, so again, Runway will do it by default. It'll just do a center crop. It'll just take the center cropping and, and crop it down. If you want to get more exact with how you do croppings, um, there are some tools inside of the data set tools library to do better cropping. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fine art rather than like a, a simple practice, right? So here's an example of where if I did a crop to square, so basically you just crop from the, the longest sides uh, until it's a square. Um, if I look at these four images, um, or sorry, these three, God, I really can't count today. Um, if I look at these three images, um, this one works out fine, right? Like, okay, I might get a minion in like 1% of my images, not the end of the world. Maybe it's like a nice Easter egg. Um, but you know, Bone Bone's face is fine. Cropping this one down also looks good. This one is where it gets to be a problem, right? So if I look at this one, uh, it crops Bone Bone's eyes out. And like, maybe that's fine. Maybe I just like, it learns snouts a little bit better than, than other things. But ideally what I would like to do is I'd like to figure out a way to solve that. And there are a bunch of options within these cropping tools, um, but one way to do it would be to like, just use vertical line and just crop from the top. Um, so this one, this image is still working pretty well. Um, I now have this, girl's face in there, which again, maybe not perfect, but it could be fine. Uh, this image is much better and this image is much better. So again, this is like, like this like challenge of like balancing out like how perfect do I need these to be? Um, you know, the real perfect way would be for me to open every single image and crop it exactly the square I want. Um, most of us don't have time to do that. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're really, really excited about this. Um, yeah, so you can crop differently. Uh, there's also another way, um, which I don't have an example here, which I thought I did. Um, you can also actually take the, the rectangle and you can actually just mirror the sides. Um, so another, like that's another way to get a square. I think that's actually what I did for my data set is I actually mirrored the sides um, because what that does is it keeps more of the image in your crop um, and it sort of just blurs the sides a little bit. Uh, it actually just mirrors these edges, which means in this case, I would probably get a little bit of a duplicate ear. Uh, in this case, I'd probably get a little bit of a duplicate back, um, but it is like a really, it's a pretty simple process and um, I find it tends to work well because it keeps textures in your images and it doesn't downscale stuff as much. Is mirroring the sides similar to like what they do with those YouTube videos when things are like shot in um, portrait mode and you see like the blurry of the side? I think what those do is they actually just take the whole image and they scale it up and then they like throw a blur on it. Mm. Um, but it's a similar technique or it's a similar idea, right? It's like sort of to like just hide that it's like not the same aspect ratio. Right, okay, cool. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, that's pretty much everything I want to cover. I do want to quickly highlight, um, so I recently taught a class that was entirely about making data sets, and all of those videos are on YouTube. So if you like have like six hours this week or in the next two weeks and you really want to dive into making um, data sets, uh, let me pull up this playlist really quickly. Um, there is a whole playlist on just using data set tools and a bunch of other techniques. There's some really like out there ways, like actually what I did for, um, let me see if this model exists in Runway right now. Yeah, so there's a, a model here called Five Cats, which I, so I actually did this with uh, five different Instagram cats. Um, and I, what I actually did is I actually trained a, 
uh, object detection to detect the faces of my cats. So that way, what I was able to do is I was able to scrape all of these Instagram images, and I was able to actually pull out using an object detector the actual shape of every cat's face. Then I used another data set tool library script I have to crop those all the square. Um, so this one, when it's, when it's up and loaded, I'll, I'll sort of show you what this looks like. Um, but there's you can get very, very complicated in building a data set. Um, I would say for us, for this class, like just make a data set. Don't worry about it being perfect. Don't get too like, don't worry about like, is it is it good enough? Is it bad enough? Because the thing is like part of it, just like if you just make a data set and using StyleGAN, you will learn like what sort of worked and what didn't and you'll be able to come back to it and sort of make tweaks to it. Um, so I would say like, don't overthink it, just have fun making a data set. Um, but I do have a bunch of uh, playlists on making data sets if you're interested. Another, oh, another technique that I didn't even talk about, but it is one that if you're looking for like a, maybe a fast and easy way is actually to take a video um, and actually turn that video into individual frames. Um, so let me actually see that. That's probably, um, I thought MPEG YouTube. So um, if you're interested, I will, I'll, I'll put links to all these videos and these playlists. Um, but if you're interested, I have a video here on how to convert a video into individual frames. Um, one thing to note about doing video is it kind of just ends up repeating the video but sometimes there's interesting like sort of breaks where it like breaks away from the from the sequence or like it can, gets confused and like jumbles up the sequence. Um, it can be a cool effect, but I would say like if you're really interested in creating sort of that like uh, the fake image sort of thing, you might want something besides um, a video. Um, I can I'll, I'll link to some examples of how that stuff works. Um, but if you're interested, yeah, I would probably just like recommend trying Instagram scraper or trying the Pinterest scraper. Um, to generate some some videos from those first. Um, so I just clearly like going off a little bit. So this is the data sets uh, class. I'll post a link to this. Um, and there's also a, where is it here? A data set demos uh, playlist. So um, I'll put these in our class notes, um, just to make sure we have them. Um, but this is actually this video here will be pretty much the exact same video I just showed you. Um, but there are a bunch of tools in here on uh, installing it, um, doing resizing and cropping, um, removing duplicates. Um, there are a bunch of demos here on how to do scraping and other things. Um, so there's a bunch of tools here. I would sort of say just like find a topic you're interested in, start digging into it. Um, and if you have questions or like get stuck somewhere, like please reach out to me. Um, you're always welcome to DM me on Slack and just say like, hey, can we talk for 10 minutes over Zoom or something? Um, and I can show you what I'm working on and you can sort of give me some help. I'm happy to do that at any point. So um, please feel free to reach out and, and ask about that. Um, so yeah, so we won't be meeting next week, but we'll be meeting the week after. Um, if people do want to meet next week, just to sort of show what they're doing in their data set and just get some feedback, just let me know. Just again, like DM me or put a, put a note in our class Slack. Um, and if like one or two or three people want to meet, I'm happy to just set up some time. Um, and we can just like jump on a Zoom again and just sort of talk through projects. Um, anything else I'm, I'm missing? So yeah, so next week or the, the following week after, we will talk about how to actually take our data set, put it in a uh, runway, and then actually train a style again model with it. Any questions? Two questions on my side. Um, the horse to zebra training that or that model that we had, is that something that you have like one data set of both horses and zebras, or is it two separate data sets and then they're talking to each other? Yeah, so that is a that is a different type of network. That is a network called CycleGAN. Um, unfortunately, you can't train CycleGAN networks inside of Runway. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say you could try actually combining horses and zebras instead of a single style again model. Um, yeah. It would look different or the outputs would be different, but it, it would probably work actually. Okay. And then thinking back to the Simpson, the Simpson Heaven um, model where it's it's training first Simpson faces, then compositionally on Basquiat faces. Could you do something similar where like you, you train like your human faces first and then you train it on like different compositions? Is that two data sets or is it you're putting both the composition and the human faces into one data set? Uh, that example is two different data sets. Um, we'll cover a little bit of that uh, when we actually look at training because 
Um, one I would say, if you're going to transfer, sorry, this is a thing called transfer learning, uh, which is essentially like you take one model and you learn on top of that model from a different data set. Um, that's called transfer learning. We'll talk about that more next week. Um, if you are going to do that and you want to do it from faces, don't, don't build a data set of faces. Uh, we will just we'll actually what we will do by default um, in, in runway is actually train off of their FFHQ model, which is the faces model. Um, so you will actually let me I can probably show you a, what, it, what that looks like um, inside a runway. Let's go here. Let's go train. And Okay, so uh, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but um, what you'll be able to do inside of Runway, ah, this, this isn't the right one. Hold on, let me go back one. Sure. Um, so you will actually, ah, this is wrong too. Hold on, <laughs> sorry, one second. I have trained a lot of models in here. Wow. Okay. Um, so you'll actually start with faces. In most cases, you will start with faces and you will train using your new data set. And you will have a very interesting little moment in here where you will get faces that uh, look like cat fur faces. Um, this is a very common thing. So essentially, what you can do if you want to, if you have two custom models you want to train from and you want to see that mix. What you can do is you can train one model. And then when that model is done, you will do what we call continue training or transfer learning off of your other model with a new data set. So that's totally doable within Runway um, and is a pretty common technique. And we'll talk about how to get those. Like if this is the, uh, let's say, if this is the step that you want to download and like use instead of Runway, I'll show you how to do that. OK. Yeah. Cool. Got it. Um, and then the second question I had for collecting data sets, you just want us to like put all those images into like a folder and then we'll work off that folder afterwards, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So all you need is um, all of your images in one folder. I think they can even be subfolders. Uh, and then we'll just upload it to Runway. And I believe Runway will just process all that from there. OK. And then if we wanted to train based off of text, would it just be individual text files? Uh, so if you want to, if you like images of text or text of like text text? Text text. So like, yeah. Text. So I probably won't cover um, how to use GPT-2 inside Runway, um, but there is a demo on Runway's uh, YouTube channel if you want to do that. Okay. Um, so I'd probably recommend, like, everyone should have an image data set. If you're interested in playing with other stuff, um, let me know, and I can sort of send you resources to do that. Cool. Yeah, I want to feed it all my emails from the past five years and see if they can write emails for me. It probably will, yeah. Right. All right, I'm good. Thanks, man. No worries. Um, any other questions about data sets? Yeah, I've got a quick one on the, the, the size. Did you say we want them 1024 by 1024? Yeah, that's the ideal size. You can be bigger. Um, if you're bigger, Runway will just scale them down. If you're okay. smaller, Runway will scale them up and then it'll introduce like artifacting and stuff. But um, gotcha. if you can do 1024 by 1024, that's, that's perfect. Cool. Anything else? Does anyone have an idea for a data set they want to talk about? I was thinking about one thing. Um, you know, I, I also like collect cards. And so I was wondering if a set of cards would be of interest, but I, I don't know if there's a set that has 500, but like if it was like a, I mean, like I've got some old baseball cards or some old basketball cards or just different and the borders might stay the same or the logo this might change but in the same position um but I was wondering if that would be you know could cause problems oh wow there's one there awesome <laughs> nice yeah so this is Amazing. uh this is someone from the last class did baseball cards oh cool yeah I've got that same set the 87 <laughs> pops yep the wood grain yeah that's a, that's a popular set but so totally. so you'll see the text gets totally demolished, right? Yeah. Uh, and the faces are a little weird. Um, and again, this is just because I don't know how many images he actually ended up finding or grabbing from, but um, uh -huh. you know, you'll see that everything else looks pretty good, but like the faces are a little strange, just because probably again the faces aren't all in the same position. So 
um you just sort of like deal with what you also yeah my guess yeah. is just looking at this he might have had some images that were either cropped differently or like different sizes um because i'm also noticing the gotcha. top logo itself is also a little weird so um i like my my general rule of thumb is like just try stuff sure like, we'll talk about pricing again um next week just to remember like what prices are for these things but you know it's 20 bucks 25 dollars to generate a model um mm -hmm. and you've got a hundred dollars in credit so i just sort of say like make some shit see what happens yeah cool cool oh that's that's good to know yep on my side i'm thinking about uh style again training off of my drawings i i guess i have one like question for you in terms of uh let me see if my camera can catch it so like if I have all of these drawings, right, and these are all separate images, mm -hmm. but they exist on one sketchbook page, I have two thoughts. The first being that I make this entire thing one square and call that one image. And I have like 500 images that I can yeah. use really easily. Or I go in individually and say each one of these is one individual object, and then it generates based on that. Do you know based on experience what would produce something more interesting? Do you feel like because there's more information within one square like this, it could easily become like information gets lost and it gets muddy compared to if I have like a small square of each object? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't have a perfect answer. I would probably say to start, uh, I would do each individual illustration. Okay. Yeah. I'll give that a shot. And then you, you had said that text doesn't transfer well because it gets obliterated or muddy mushy yeah yeah mushy. And so is it better to have colored images then because a lot of mine are just black and white is there what should i like color grade it then first before putting it into the system so i would say the illustrations you have there should be fine um in when when run through i would say just if you have text and it's like a lot of text it will just turn i mean again i think this this example here of just sort of the baseball card where like it just gets obliterated because it knows text goes in that region, but it doesn't know how to draw letters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know what sequence of letters should look like. So it just sort of like turns it all into almost like alien language, which is maybe cool, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll start with the small images first then and go from there. Yep. Sweet. I've got one more question just came to mind. Have, have you had uh, students use like uh, images from uh, NASA? Like if you, those public images that are free that you can grab from? Um, I, I haven't personally seen anyone do that, but I have, I do think there's, um, there is a model, there either was a model at one point or there is a model right now that, that is set up to do that. Um, cool. Let me just see, nebulas maybe? Interesting, maybe, maybe they removed it, but there is, there used to be a nebula model. Um, cool. But I would definitely recommend trying it again. Um, yeah. I think it's worth, worth playing with, yeah. Okay, cool. Derek, as a quick aside, you had said earlier um, the word entangled when like the machine doesn't know if it's like a nose or like a, a hairline. Would that be something similar where like if you if you have too much information in one area, it can get entangled and start putting wrong things in the wrong place? Um, so entanglement's a little different. Entanglement is actually, uh, so like, uh, maybe you, maybe, maybe some of you saw where Photoshop, uh, just rolled out some new machine learning tools where basically you can take a photo of someone's face and you can age it, um, using like a slider. Um, entanglement is usually what happens is, um, what quite often happens in machine learning models is like, let's say I want to age someone's face. Um, well, if, if. I know what aging looks like. Quite often what will happen is the machine learning model will also add glasses to someone's face, right? And that's where it tracks because like older people generally have worse eyesight and that means you need glasses. So like there's these funny things where like you might say, I want this person to look older, meaning I want them to have whiter hair. And it actually ends up like adding glasses and other features to them because that's what it assumes all old people look like. Um, so that's actually what we mean by entanglement. Um, and the challenge there is just like, it's a machine learning problem where like it just, I mean, again, it's like, it's not a human, right? So it doesn't know what these features mean. And it just sort of like combines things together. Um, so in, uh, that's less to do with the data. Well, I mean, that's, that's, it's kind of because of the data set, but it's also just like machine learning models just aren't human and they don't know differences in things the way we do. Um, so that's probably more what entanglement is. Um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about having too much data in one area. I mean, one way to, again, to think about these is that you do sort of want to think about these as onion skins. 
if you want a really like pristine model. Um, and if you have areas where there's a lot of change in that onion skin, that those likely will be areas where there's a lot of confusion or muddle, a muddled output as well. Um, yeah. So it's more like, what are, what's the change across your data set? Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. I might do really quick. I might do some uh, data set of some of my research reference, mm. or or I'm trying to figure out if it should be some of the research reference or just like some of the textures from research I'm not really sure yet, but um, I I don't know if I have 500 images of <laughs> 500 different research reference, but um, I was going to do that or the ceramics. Though I do ceramics too, so that one project you showed was like <laughs> something I exactly wanted to do. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I think I'll probably do some of this Rezo graph stuff. Cool. Yeah, one thing I would also say for like 3D objects is um, it might be a case of where you do, again, do another like, you could take like a little video, like a short little video of them and just sort of like move, like pan the camera around a little bit and then turn those into frames. Um, and you could even like, one thing I talk a lot about in that video that I'll, that I'll link to is um, what your frames per second or your frame rate is, right? So generally it records like 60 frames per second, but you don't want all 60 frames, right? You might only want one frame per second and that will give you different angles, but it's like, mm -hmm. or you just like shoot them one by one at those angles. Um, so again, like that will give you a different perspective, almost like, um, I'm almost thinking about this, like, that's almost like cubism applied to style again, right? Where like, it will like try to morph these angles together in weird ways. Um, oh, cool. Whereas what Fran did was sort of like the exact same, like, you know, she probably set up a tripod and just like moved her can't move her objects in and out. So there's mm -hmm. different ways to apply these things depending on what you want to get out of it as well. Cool, that makes sense. Anybody else? If not, we'll wrap up for the night. Okay, so um, again, no class next week. But if you are like mid process of a data set and you want help or you just want to ask some questions, um, please DM me. Even if you can't meet next Wednesday, I'm happy to like set up some time for us to talk. Um, I can also often like people ask me like, hey, how do I do this? And I'll send you a video, not because I don't want to tell you, but because like I recorded a video that actually explains it better than I could tell you in real time. Um, so often send people videos of like, hey, like check out this thing and then let me know if you have other questions. Um, yeah, so uh, again, happy to help with things if you're in the middle of working on a data set. I should also say, it's not like you need a data set by next week um, because we will just demo, be demoing the project. So if you need like a third week to do your data set, you totally can. Um, training your models in runway takes about six to eight hours. Um, so just know that you want to have that much time available to you. Um, but if you know you're still in the middle of making a data set and you just want to watch the demo and then keep the recording and then come back to it, um, that is totally fine. So. Uh, this will definitely be the most intense like part of this class um, in part just because it's a lot of manual labor um, but yeah again like just do what you need to do and um, i'm happy to help if i can cool one last question derek yeah. um between black and white if, if most of my images are black and white can i also incorporate color-based drawings in the data set as well and would that end up bleeding into the black and white or would it just end up being confusing? Um, it's sort of like, let's find out. It's sort of always my, my like sort of default answer. Um, right. Again, I think like it's worth remembering that machine learning models are essentially big statistical models, right? The, they're big statistical models that say like, hey, based on these things, like what's the likelihood of this thing happening or likelihood of this thing happening? So if you have 10% of your images are color, there's when you like traverse the latent space, there's probably a 10% chance you'll get other color in your images. Um, that's like kind of a, that's kind of a misnomer, but like that's one way I would think about it, just to like sort of like uh, broad stroke it. Cool. Um, one quick question. When we upload our data sets to Runway, are they still private or are they become part of the larger database of images worldwide or whatever? They're, they're, they're entirely private. So we'll talk about this when we get to, uh, once you're finished with your training, you can set your model to be public, but your data set is never is never public. Um, but if like so, the person who trained the Simpsons model, they decided they wanted to share their model with the world, then you can totally do that. Um, but anything that you don't want to share, um, any trainings like are private to you. 
Now, obviously, like they are accessible on uh, runway servers, so like the runway folks can sometimes look at them if you run into a problem. Mm -hmm. But like for all intents and purposes, they are completely private to you. Cool. That's a good question, though. I should definitely remember to cite that next time. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, um, if I don't talk to you next week, I hope everyone has a good Thanksgiving because um, our Australian is not here. So everyone else in America, um, I think. Yes. Um, so hope you have a good Thanksgiving, even if it's just like eating at home. Uh, at least you get to eat some good food or whatever. Um, and again, you're welcome to reach out to me. But if not, I will see you all in two weeks. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks, Bye, everybody. Yep. Thanks. Thanks.